Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another great stream from the GEO Institute. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the GEO Institute, and we are excited to bring you this afternoon the 2022 Monismith Lecture. Why 2022, you ask? Well, in case you've been living in a cave for the last four years, COVID happened and messed up a lot of things, and we got a little behind on some stuff, and we're catching up this year. So we are very happy to bring you the lecture, even though we're a tad on the delayed side. The 2021 lecture was given in 2022. We're going to get all caught up and everything's going to be okay. But welcome. If you don't know anything about the GEO Institute, after you watch the lecture today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org, and there you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to, this is a good one, you want to click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. One more pitch for you this afternoon. While you are at geoinstitute.org, you can join the 96 Club to support our student programs. A donation of $96, 100% of it goes to the student programs, and you can get either a Carl Terzaghi bobblehead to display somewhere in your home, office, or I guess car if you really wanted to, or a pair of Geo Institute socks that has the shield on there. It is majestic in shape, form, and color. So you should definitely do one of those things. Now, before we get to the intro and the lecture, a little bit about the Mana Smith lecture. GI has five named lectures, Terzaghi, Peck, Seed, Monismith, and Prakash is the newest one. The Monismith Lecture was established in 2010 to honor the work of Carl Monismith, legendary Berkeley professor, and his contributions to pavement engineering, where he spent more than 50 years working in that area. So we name a lecturer every year. It's always a top-notch individual who's <clears throat> devoted their career to pavement engineering. And the lecture is either held at the Pavements Conference that comes every other year. Sometimes it's at Geo Congress. And a couple times we've done it this way, live stream. <laughs> either way, it's exciting. It's a big deal. And we are very, very happy to be bringing it to you today. And to do the introduction for this year's lecturer, here is Tom Papagenakis of UT San Antonio. Tom, take it away, and thanks for doing this. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, it's a true privilege to introduce Dr. Massad, uh, who is the Zachary Professor in Design and Construction Integration at Texas A&M. He currently serves as the Executive Director of Global Partnerships uh, for the Texas A&M University's uh, Engineering College. Uh, Dr. Massad is a true innovator. Back in the early 2000s, just after joining the faculty at Washington State University, he won an NSF Career Award that literally opened the field of micromechanical characterization and modeling of asphalt concretes, bringing this technology into the 21st century. To just mention two of the breakthroughs, ability to capture the AAC microstructure at minute detail, uh, and being able to model it using uh, finite elements and discrete elements. Uh, and second, the development of an imaging system to uh, characterize the aggregate shape, texture, and angularity. Uh, the system was called AIMS and is currently marketed by Pine Industries. A brief list of his research record, more than 250 refereed journal publications, more than 17,700 Google citations, an eight score of 76, with uh, 255 papers having more than 10 citations. His Scopus score is 52. Uh, he has graduated over 32 graduate students. Uh, a good number of those are faculty in uh, international schools in the US. Dr. Massad is a fellow of the ASC and the American Association of Advances for Science. He has won multiple awards. Uh, such as the APT Emmons Award in 2001. Incidentally, this was the first paper Dr. Massad ever submitted to APT. So he hit the ground literally running. 
And he was nominated for runner-up for the next couple of years. I think they finally stopped nominating him because he, he was highly repetitive after a point. Um, he won the prestigious ASC James Laurie Prize in 2018, and of course, this Moni Smith Award in 2022. I'm certain that we have uh, seen just the beginning of his brilliant contributions to payment engineering. On a personal note, Dr. Massad is one of the most unassuming, collegial, and kind folks you would come across. Uh, him and his wife, Lina, have four wonderful kids, which explains Iyad's aptitude at multitasking. Uh, speaking of which, I want to remind him that he owes me three chapters for the second edition of our book, uh, Pavement Design and Materials, that comes up in January. So without further ado, please join me to congratulate Dr. Massad for his 2022 Moni Smith Award. The title of his uh, talk is The All for Advanced Characterization Methods and Micromechanics in Achieving Resilient and Sustainable Asphalt Pavements. Join me to uh, welcome him. Thank you, Yed. Thank you, Tom, uh, for the great introduction and uh, for accepting to introduce me to this lecture. Uh, of course, Tom is a long-term colleague, friend, and more. So I'm grateful for him making this introduction. I am. Uh, I assume you're seeing the screen, the full screen. Correct. Yes. You're very yes. good. Okay. So I'm, I'm truly um, honored to be delivering the Carl Mon Smith lecture for at least uh, two reasons. The first no reason is the name it carries is uh, Professor Mon Smith is a role model and a person I looked up for uh, starting my career and continued to learn a lot from his work and his uh, amazing uh, contributions to the field. I'm also honored because when I look at the names of colleagues, friends who received this award before me and even the one that was received in 2023 by Professor Al-Qadi, I'm humbled by being among this uh, group of names that I always looked up for and admired uh, throughout my career. So I'm grateful for ASE and for all the colleagues who nominated me. I want to start by saying that I am also want to uh, acknowledge that everything I'm going to present today is a collaborative work. So I hope many of the people who contributed to this work are watching or listening today and uh, they can see that their work made added to my career and uh, to my colleagues and friends who collaborated with me through the journey. Um, I'm going to start by uh, giving you an outline. I'll start by speaking about the significance of the work we do and how it fits in the big picture. I'm going to highlight quickly challenges and opportunities. They come side by side, the challenges and opportunities that I believe are currently facing the pavement community. Then I'm going to focus on specific work in which we contributed in collaboration with others to creating sustainable and resilient pavements. The last part of my talk is looking forward, looking ahead. In fact, this part is an area where I'm learning. Of course, I continue to learn all aspects of this areas, but specifically the last area is something I'm getting into recently. And I wanna share thoughts with you. Uh, I'm stepping outside my comfort zone in the last part because it's an area where I'm gaining knowledge now and trying to uh, envision where we are gonna see our domain of expertise go or pavement engineering given changes in technologies. So that's the outline of my presentation. In terms of the significance, I like to point out the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And we are really fortunate community that we are easily contributing to various critical areas of these sustainable development goals, whether it's through quality education as an educator myself through developing sustainable cities and communities, through developing infrastructure or economic growth, or through sustainability by promoting responsible consumption and production. So in engineering, we are fortunate, specifically in pavement engineering, geotechnical engineering, that we can easily uh, take uh, pride 
of where our work fits in the big picture of national development or international development goals. Having said that, I'm going to speak about quickly about challenges and opportunities that we are facing nowadays and where that impacts our field. The first one, there are a lot of area, uh, uh, consideration to how autonomous driving, of course, in this case, trucks, because we're dealing with pavements, will and is and will affect our pavement design. The loading pattern is changing, means the, the stresses that our pavements will experience are changing, which requires us to have a closer look at our design methods and our materials that we use and adopt technologies that make our pavement resilient towards this major change in load application. Obviously, there's also increase in these loads of trucks in terms of numbers and terms of loads. So we are required to design better performing, long performing pavements that can sustain these, uh, this important element of the economy, which is the transportation element. So that's a challenge that we as a community are, uh, are developing and working on developing these payments that can take these change in load patterns and the frequency as well as the loads. The second challenge that pavements are no longer just passive structures. We are required to join the development and change in infrastructure systems through developing more than just passive pavements. Our pavements are now required to be communicate with vehicles. They are required to be smart in the sense that, as you see here, they have to have self-repairing, self-cleaning, self-healing structures. They are also required to energy harvest. And they are also needed to be uh, more accommodating of sensors and technologies that sense the loads and adjust the pavements. So we are now dealing with much more comprehensive system approach of dealing with pavements, more than the structural component and the material component. This area requires us, in fact, more to change the education in pavement engineering, as I will speak on towards the end. So I'm highlighting the challenges but I will speak on it as I go through my presentation. So pavement functions have changed from passive structures to smart, adaptable pavements that communicate, change, assert, sense, and uh, adjust itself. The third, of course, it's a positive challenge or an opportunity for us, the whole focus on pavement sustainability meaning that we need these pavements to be more socially integrated, more economically acceptable. In terms of achieving the engineering goals for which they are created, they meet the basic human needs and underline use resources effectively and preserve and restore the surrounding ecosystem. So we are required as a community to be aware of the use of pavement through all the stages, design, construction, use, maintenance, all the stages have to be assessed together to make sure that these pavements are sustainable. In terms of the material aspects of pavements, which is the focus of being of my research, we are working continuously as a community to reduce the use of virgin materials in favor of recycled materials. States are working on using local aggregates because of the uh, cost and because of the added carbon footprint when you transport aggregate from other sources. Reduce the impact of material production. We've seen a lot of focus on warm mixed asphalt because it has economical as well as adv environmental advantages. And we are required to improve our pavement analysis and design methods to have better reliability in our predictions. In all this, we are also reminded that sustainability is not one item of the full life. 
the entire life cycle must be considered when considering sustainability of asphalt materials and mixture, not only from economical perspective, but also environmental perspective. I personally did not work in the life cycle, but I have great appreciation of this statement because we cannot focus on sustainability in one aspect, ignoring the full life cycle. Otherwise, we may be pushing the issue from one part of the cycle to another. So these are the four opportunities, challenges that we're working on. The change in, tra in uh, truck loads, the autonomous truck load, trucks, the function of a pavement is evolving and changing. We need sustainable pavement and also finally resilient pavements. Resilient pavements, as you all know, it means that our pavements are able to withstand hits, stressors, adapt and change, and finally recover positively. Not only recover, but recover rapidly and recover even to a better stage. And what makes the focus on pavement resilience mostly is the climate change in which we see changes in temperatures, in sea levels, in precipitation. And this is data from a source here that I reference in which shows predictions of uh, climate change, which is, of course, going to affect the way we think about pavements, design pavements, and we, the way we uh, assess our pavements. This map here, by the way, these numbers is just severity level, RCP 2.6. Just think about it as scenarios of how much we as uh, humans will manage our CO2 footprint. So RCP 8.5 is the worst case where there will be continuous increase in CO2, while RCP 2.6 that it peaks at around 230 to 40, and then we will be more responsible in managing the carbon footprint. Regardless of which scenario you look at, if you look at the most severe scenario, for example, <clears throat> all the temperature increase here, if you the colors you look at is positive. So areas will see increase in temperature over <coughs> with time. When it comes to precipitation, it varies. A green means increase, and the brownish colors means decrease. It's yellow, it's negative numbers, as you see here. But overall, there is reality about change in precipitation and change in temperature. And in my talk, I will address we as a pavement community how we're going to address these changes, and what's pressing and what is not so critical for us. And that's maybe something debatable of how much this climate change will affect our payments and how we can address our changes, what technologies we can offer to address these challenges. I looked at uh, <clears throat> multiple sources from the pavement community about these um, climate changes. And I want to highlight here a few points. This is table is modified just to focus on the area that I work on, which is flexible pavements mostly. There is, of course, increase in higher pavement temperature. And when you look at the reports, it says, well, we need more rut resistance mixes, more increase in poly binder polymerization, better aggregate structure, right? And none of this is surprising. It just highlights the importance of these things that we already do. I mean, that's the research that most of my colleagues and myself are doing, doing exactly these things. Then there is higher extreme maximum temperature. There is more extreme rainfall events where it's gonna affect skid resistance, it affects moisture damage, and there will be higher average annual precipitation. Why I'm saying this, I believe that there are lessons learned from these reports and this knowledge. What are these lessons? And that's where I'm going to make my point about where we can contribute to addressing climate change and its effects on pavement. First of all, most of these models are national, global models, and they need to be translated to regional and local because that's where pavements serve at a local scale. And the other conclusion caught my attention in one of these reports highlighted down below, emphasized. There is climate change is slow on the scale of current pavement life cycle. So the life cycle pavement is 20, 30 years, and climate change takes longer to have an effect. And then investigate the use of robust materials. 
designs that perform better. So none of this, honestly, is surprising to me. Well, that's what we do. We better we we focus on developing more age resistance mixes, more moisture resistance mixes. So where is the opportunity? What are the things we can contribute that to more than what we are currently doing? I divide the impact into two parts. There is the slow impacts due to changes over decades, aging, diffusion, moisture damage, skid resistance, rotting wood. And there is the rapid impact due to extreme events, flooding of the pavement, extreme high temperature within days or a couple of weeks. I personally think that the slow changes, we are taking care of them implicitly by the incremental change of work that we do, by adding more technologies into polymer modified asphalt, by developing better methods to, to design asphalt mixes. So I'm not so concerned about the first part. The second part is where there is a serious opportunity, real opportunity for us to contribute to handling extreme events. And I want to make the point in my presentation that we as a community has developed quite advanced tools that can be adopted and adapted to address these extreme events. So that's the um, upfront, that's the point I want to make, that we do have technology tools now available to us. We developed in the research community needs to be transferred to the application in which we can handle and analyze and better analyze these extreme events and be more prepared for it. So having said that, now I'm going to visit with you research contributions into sustainable and resilient payment. So the points I made, I will address them in showing research examples, making my point that we do have developed as a community tools, characterization tools, modeling tools that are readily available to transfer knowledge and to develop sustainable and resilient payment. So I'll show highlight some of these examples. One, one area, of course, a lot of research is being done on, high, on adopting plastics into asphalt, not only because we want to recycle plastics, but we look at it as it's an upcycling effort in which we take a waste and convert it to a, an added value material. A lot of work done on reclaimed asphalt pavements, in fact, not work only, but advancing this field from rubber modified asphalt and warm asphalt. I will highlight a couple of examples in which advanced characterization tools which are not routinely used in our community in the practice, can help us to design these materials which much, with much more confidence. So that's the point I'm going to make through research example. We can, through these characterization tools, make them more standardized. They need standardization because currently the methods are done with a lot of judgment by the users. They need standardization. And once we standardize them, we can really use them smartly to design plastic modified asphalt, reclaimed asphalt mixes, warm mixes, so on and so forth. So let me highlight some examples. One area I worked on with the colleagues, uh, Dr. Amy Epps Martin, and uh, we have graduate students and others, is evaluate the effects of recycling agents on recycled binder blends with consideration to aging. RAP has advantages, but also there are concerns that wrap recycled asphalt make the material susceptible to cracking. So there is a uh, technologies developed materials, recycling agents, to restore the rheological properties. So basically, you want your aged asphalt and your new asphalt, virgin asphalt, mix better together and stay as a more homogeneous uh, material rather than two materials just mixed physically together. That's the value of these agents. And we want to analyze the, the real contribution of these agents in truly modifying the asphalt rather than just diluting the properties and making it look softer, but not really changing it. For that, we have been using nano uh, measurements using atomic spark microscopy, very powerful tool. If it's used correctly, it can give you phases, it can give you moduli of the material at a nanoscale, 
and it can give you uh, even there are technologies that can give you uh, AFM IR, IR infrared that can give you even chemical composition of the material. So now the question, how do we use such an advanced tool in order to design recycled asphalt binders that we have confidence in their performance and confidence in the uh, recycling agents that are used in the binder? So here is an example. This is just the concept. We use different modes of the operation of AFM. One is called peak force quantitative nanomechanical mode, and the other one, which much uh, very recent, is NDMA. So this gives you more like elastic properties, if you wish, in addition to adhesion, uh, deformation, and energy dissipation. NDMA gives you more uh, mechanical properties. Those who work in rheology, this gives you the rheological properties at the nanoscale. So I want to highlight examples here. So this is an example of a PLT dissertation by Amal Abdelaziz, uh, where when you mixed, this is the wrap before re recycling agents, and this is with recycling agents. Immediately you notice, before adding the recycling agents, there are two bimodal, bimodal distribution, which tells us that the wrap that we added and the virgin asphalt that we put together, they are not mixed in a homogeneous fashion. They are still separated, as we can see from the moduli. And as we age it, this separation even becomes more pronounced. And for this specific rejuvenator, not all of them behave this way. When we put it, it's actually made it <clears throat> one uh, distribution, single mode distribution, model distribution, which means, well, that's, that's good news. That's this uh, recycling agent made the two binders mix well together, even with agents. So that's a good start. I'm heading towards a direction where I show observations, and then I show how do we use this technology to give you a, a, a quantifying parameter to look at <coughs> the effectiveness of this rejuvenation uh, practice. The other observation from the work of uh, a colleague, Irina Holleran, I reference her work quite often because of the value that uh, it added, where the observation is when you add this rejuvenation, an effective one does not only change the, the, the rheological properties. The, the noticing one is that an effective one has deassociated these polar groups it broke them into smaller and smaller pieces. So that's the second observation. One is the is making it single model distribution. Second, that these uh, polar associations get broken into smaller pieces. And that's a positive development. We want the rejuvenation, at least that's what we hypothesize and we say that we need this rejuvenation to do just that. But one thing to our observation some rejuvenation techniques worked well when we are unaged. So this recycled control before adding the rejuvenation looks has peak, a lot of peaks and valleys because it's two material. And it really worked well and unified it when you look at this rejuvenating peak without aging. However, as soon as we aged it, in some cases, we noticed that this rejuvenation material is like did not make big difference. We really means that uh, it works initially, but once the material ages, this rejuvenating agent or recycling agent lost its contribution. So we were concerned about that. So the question is, how do we combine all these observation into one quantitative measure? We came up with something called the rejuvenation index that quantify three things here quantifies the change in the modulus measured using the AFM, atomic sphoric microscopy. It quantifies the texture using a technique called wavelet analysis. I'm not going to get into it here, but if you're interested, I, I reference the papers here. It looks at the homogeneity of the surface. So one looks at surface characteristics, one look at mechanical characteristics. Not only that, we looked at what happens to these parameters over aging, 0 to 40, Zero means unaged, 40 means aged in the lab to the extreme, 40 hours of aging. This method <clears throat> that captures the three observations showed clearly that some rejuvenators, higher value is better, 
are truly superior to others, while others may not serve the purpose because they are not de-associating the polar group or they are losing their value with aging. So we feel that that's a contribution that where advanced characterization methods have been used successfully to end up serving the community in assessing uh, the value of recycling agents. Switching to plastic modified asphalt, it's a big, big topic. And the challenge with, uh, with the plastic modified asphalt, the wide variety of plastics, and there are questions to be asked. What is a suitable binder to be used for this process? Is it, does do plastics work with all binders equally? How do we assess how compatible they are with the binder? And there is also efforts to add what's called compatibilizer to improve the interaction of the plastics with the asphalt. Are they useful? That's another question. And finally, depends where you are, aging is very important because plastomer, these are plastics, can be susceptible to aging and you don't want to create a problem down the road with using them. So I'm trying, I'm going to show some results that address these questions. In terms of the type of asphalt in these publications here, this work was done by uh, Western Research Institute where they came up with indices on the composition of the asphalt based on SARA analysis that gave indices on the binders that are Based on the, these indices, you can recommend the binder for modification or not by polymer. In our work, we show we have shown or we have uh, confirmed that truly we these indices, which is one look at the st stability index or instability index, looks at the composition. <clears throat> one is called aging index, and one looks at the very condensed or aromatics, these indices where we found them to be very useful in terms of identifying binders that are more friendly in accommodating plastics. So we recommended to that this is in this characterization method is useful for that purpose. Work of my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Basin, I missed the year here, this is 2022, it should be here. And uh, uh, Anand, who was a postdoc, this collaboration work with UT Austin, they use the Hansen solubility parameter. It, it's actually worked very well for us, in which <clears throat> you look at the solubility of the plastics based on their chemical analysis with the asphalt. Simple. This is the asphalt domain, the solubility asphalt in this uh, domain. This is an example of SBS, a lot of overlap, that's good, means SBS polymer is friend is mixed well with the bitumen. It's a good candidate to modify the bitumen. And then when we tried two types of plastics, um, we got two types of plastics, one called PE1, just give it a generic name. They are both plast uh, plastomers, both actually uh, polyethylene for sure, but there was discussion about uh, what type of polyethylene it is. One, we are sure it is linear, uh, uh, low density polyethylene, the other one we are not quite sure based on the composition. It shows that this PE1 falls right in the domain, or domain of the bitumen, while PE2, we cannot even dry, uh, plot it on this chart because it's off the chart, which is not good. That was a very good screening tool because when the group in, in UT Austin did more mechanical testing, detailed mechanical testing, truly found that the PE1 has a lot of ductility with the asphalt, have high strength and a lot of ductility, which you want. While the PE2, the other one, did not do well at all. So that advanced method of doing the Hansen solubility, which is a popular test in chemical analysis, served us well in screening the type of plastics that we can blend with the asphalt versus the ones that are not good candidates with the asphalt. Then we went into aging. In aging, we went back to the AFM and we measured two things. We zoomed in on the plastic modified asphalt. We looked at the properties at different locations. And we looked at what happened to the nanostructure with aging, as you see here. And in this work, we have shown that the further the material at the nanostructure travel due to aging, the G star, the worse the combination is. 
and we want the travel through due to aging and dynamic structure to be less. The other observation is, and that helps us to design better plastic modified asphalt. That's the bottom line. We designed better plastic modified asphalt. We designed them with different compatibilizers. Also, the other thing we wanted to have is when we look at this dynamic modulus, we don't want to see this. We don't want to see two completely separate phases. We want them to be more integrated like this slide. So we were able to use the Hansen Solubility Index and the uh, binder SARA analysis in addition to AFM in order to design better or uh, plastic modified asphalt. Of course, chemical analysis was also useful in terms of characterization in which in this work, we have shown that the carbonyl index, uh, the smaller that value is, the better the combination. And by the way, this work, once we identified them using this type of chemical analysis, we subjected them to extensive mechanical testing, and we have shown that these indices that I presented or these methods, chemical rheological methods, have shown, saved us a lot of work before we go to the mix uh, test. All right, I talked about examples from the binder domain. Now I'm going to switch to the aggregate sustainability. On the aggregate sustainability, our contribution has been in using the aggregate imaging system to come up with detailed properties of the aggregate, shape properties in this case. I mean, it's not mechanical, it's shape, in which we can look at the distribution of texture, the distribution of angularity, and the distribution of the dimension. What do we do with this information? One of the important aspects of uh, resilience, specifically, is that moisture and the flooded will affect the skid resistance of the paint. So this work, in this work, we used the AIMS results along with aggregate gradation and pavement texture and some measure of traffic, it's an average traffic index, to predict what happens to the skid resistance over years. Uh, we could not verify it over years, but we verified this method over three, four years, but we could not do it longer because of the project duration. So on the aggregate side, our, we, we came up with a way, a method by which we take aggregate shape characteristics, a lot of data about aggregate shape, not only average values, and combine it in models, statistical models, to predict the skid resistance. Another contribution that I, I want to highlight here, an area of interest, is using local aggregates. And on the use of local aggregates, um, there are concerns that this local aggregates, I use the word, the term soft here, because it's soft in terms of mechanical properties or resistance to abrasion. And the question was posed uh, to us by, uh, at the time, Texas Department of Transportation, can we use these aggregates? I mean, we have these aggregates around uh, different areas of Texas, can we use them? So what we came up with is uh, collaborative work. This was with UT El Paso at the time. <clears throat> is to say, let's model it. Let's see what happens to these aggregates, and we call them soft and hard, in different gradations. For that, we uh, went to different gradations. We created different mixtures. We imaged them using X-ray computer tomography. We converted these images into a discrete element model. We, and we modeled the aggregate shape accurately, as you can see. And we said, what happens to this aggregate structure if I use different aggregate properties. So now you have uh, an open domain of asking what if, if I replace it with soft aggregate, what happens? If I use 10%, 20%, 30%, 100%, what if I use this type of mix and that type of mix? The advantage of computational analysis is that you can do a lot of these what if scenarios in a short period of time. So <coughs> first, of course, we did a lot of calibration in terms of calibrating the mixtures and calibrating the aggregate, we tested the aggregates. We got the mechanical properties of the aggregate and the mixtures. We calibrated our discrete element models. And then we started putting different types of aggregates. 100% strong igneous rock, 100% soft limestone, or combinations of which. But the nice about it, you don't have to only assign one property to the aggregate. If you have a distribution of properties, you can assign a distribution here. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and we can do multiple cases. You can put 30% of soft aggregate randomly placed. Just the beauty of computational analysis. And we came up with a very, what we thought is a useful maps. Because we looked at the crushing of the aggregates under different types of loading, and we found, for example, this is just an example, in one mix, one of the mixes, <clears throat> if you use up to 40% of this local limestone, you are not compromising the strength. But if you use more than that, you start to compromise the strength of the mixture. In that case, in this specific, we our recommendation was you can use this type of aggregate in this type of dense graded mixes, but don't use it in porous friction cores because the stresses are higher and you can use up to 40 or 30% of it. So it allowed us to start incorporating these local type of sources, aggregates into the mixtures without just all the time of hauling aggregates from long distance. So that's on the aggregate side. Let me touch on the resilience. Uh, let's see, okay, I'll move faster because of time. I'm gonna talk about now resilience and how do we address climate change. I'm, I'm making this statement. There's a clear evidence of the impact of climate change impacts. However, we have a challenge, a real challenge, that the current tools we use in the practice to assess the effect of climate change are just too limited to capture that effect. And I express it this way. We measure climate change with a micrometer. I mean, the change is four, five, six degrees at the national scale. But if you look at the local scale, we really don't know exactly how much change is. Then we mark it with a chart. We use layered elastic analysis. That's not really suitable to predict the effect of these degrees on pavement for 20, 30 years. And unfortunately, when we interpret the results, we interpret it using conventional statistical methods. So what I'm saying that this measure with a micrometer, mark with a chalk and cut with an ax just doesn't work. The tools currently used in the practice are limited. I mean, they have use, of course, usefulness, but when it comes to climate change and the effect on brains are quite limited in capturing the effect of climate change on pavements. So I'm proposing that we do have tools. We have micromechanical analysis tools, material characterization tools like the one I presented, and macromechanical computational tools that maybe can be useful if we develop it further, even with what we currently have to assess climate change. I will make the case through two examples. For example, we know there has been a lot of development in several groups in developing computational models that can predict or simulate the pavement performance under repeated loading. This type of computational modeling is quite ready or useful to predict what happens to a pavement when it's flooded under traffic. Do I put the traffic on it, trucks or it should not be open to trucks? And what happens to it? How much damage is going to experience if it's open to traffic? So these computation tools, in fact, I claim that these computation tools are even more suitable for extreme conditions over a short period of time than using them to predict the long-term performance of pavement. Because they are, they are not so efficient when it comes to long term, 10, 20 years, because of the time it takes to run these models. But they are quite good when we have a scenario in which there is an extreme heat environment and we want to look at what happens to our pavement under these extremes. And then what do I do? What mixes I use? What materials? What structure in order to make it more resilient to this extreme? So the point I'm making is these computational tools are even more. Uh, easier to adopt and more suitable for the extreme scenarios of extreme of climate change due to development of uh, flooding scenario or uh, heat wave. Let's see next. Yeah. And uh, the application of it has been used. Here is a study by uh, the Waterways Experiment Station, the Army Corps of Engineers, in which they use such models, PANDA, which was developed at Texas A&M University, to simulate different sections of pavements under 
uh, aircraft gear and look at what happens to these payments. And in this paper, if you look at it, there is quite success in simulating these scenarios because extreme wave, heat wave or extreme uh, or flooding area, it is really, if you pass trucks uh, on it, it's weeks and it can be used like it's used here to predict the performance of these payments. Poor pressure. Poor pressure is another extreme scenario where these models can be used because if you have a flooded pavements means you are going to have poor pressure. So in this case, this work by uh, uh, Shakiba, Darabi and Little of, uh, when they were at uh, Shakiba was at Texas University, in which you take the structure from X-ray computed tomography and you model it to look at what happens to it under saturated air voids. So now you can do scenarios in which you analyze different mixtures with different pore structure and pore pressure to see is this mix suitable in a flooded scenario. It's not a slow diffusion process. This is a rapid pore pressure, pore stresses, uh, stresses due to pore pressure development. This map here, this picture showing the stresses, the damage distribution, and this one is a zooming on this corner. So now I can say for this area that's subjected to flooding, we need this type of mixture because on type, when I run this type of model, this is the mixture that would handle pore pressure well. Or if I have a drainage system, does it how, how do I design my drainage system so these pore pressures are not uh, dramatic to affect and fail my business? And we can even do more in terms of we can capture these images or we can even generate them. So we can de design mixtures. We can be innov design innovative mixtures that we can play computationally with it or adjust it computationally till we find the optimum structure that this is computationally created mixture. So it's not only we characterize a candidate of a mixture, but we can also design ones that can minimize the effect of these stresses. Okay. Let me touch on an area. So far, I made the point of what are the challenges and opportunities. I talked about sustainability and some areas that uh, where advanced characterization methods can help us to design these sustainable materials. I talked about pavement resilience, and I spoke about also tools and characterization tools computationally mainly to help us design these resilient pavements. And I made the case that these computational methods and advanced characterization methods are even more um, ready or more uh, suitable for these uh, uh, extreme cases than the conventional design of pavements over 20, 30 years. Of course, the whole world is talking now about artificial intelligence. So this is an area I'm, I'm learning more and more on it. So I want to share some thoughts on this topic. I'm no, by no means an expert on this domain. I'm a student learning in this domain, but I want to share some thoughts. Maybe there are graduate students or researchers listening tonight. Uh, to, tonight in my time, I'm in Qatar, but today for many of you um, on this. So I want to say, how do we use AI in terms of designing materials and give some reflection on our specific materials? I'll talk about material characterization, uh, about developing models of materials. And I use this source, really good paper um, that I, I rely on here in terms of explaining how do we use AI to design materials, in our case, pavement materials or geomaterials. So let me give a couple of examples. This image here is from a recent paper in 2021 by colleagues from uh, Vienna, I believe. The amount of data generated by these characterization methods is extremely overwhelming. You are looking at few micron image of an asphalt. Not only this, you are looking here at a, at a topography image, up and down. Here you are looking at more chemical analysis of this image using AF, AFM infrared. Here you're looking at, as you can see, fluorescence image. And here you are zooming on a point in the image and you are looking at its chemical composition. 
this amount of data currently allowing for this is wasted because we don't know how to use all this data about asphalt binder to design better asphalt binders, to modify them. In using AI, we can bridge the relationship between this chemical structure, uh, phase or uh, topography, chemical, physical, and even rheological, the ones I presented earlier, the modulus, and we can extract information much more efficiently using these AI methods to extract information about our binder. Once you extract this information, you can relate it to material properties. So now I can combine data from multiple characterization methods, such a huge data, very useful data that currently we interpret it by what's called domain expert that can try to interpret it. But to use AI, we can dig deeper and relate this material together. Once we relate it, we can now predict material properties and performance. So I can say, well, I want an asphalt binder modified with the plastics that had the following features because I can map it to certain property in the space that I need. That's another example of an image from our colleagues in IMPA and ETR Zurich, in which you look at an image and you it's overwhelming the amount of data. You can look at phases, you can look at uh, here uh, the chemical composition, you can look at topography, and now this AI can help us to bridge this relationship and take it into properties. Once I do this, I can now use this data in order to predict properties and performance. Not only this, the amount of data we collect at the nano scale or at chemical scale, I think AI can help us to bridge the relationship between the chemical scale, the chemical properties we get, into a higher scale, higher scale, and even to a macro scale, in which now I, when we predict the performance at the macro scale, we can relate it to the chemical composition of the binder. Maybe that's an optimistic, but I think we can work towards this goal of bridging the different scales using AI models and inform these macro scale models in order, when I, do, when I get a performance in my computational model, I can know that this is because of a certain property we measured at the chemical structure or in the, in the chem asphalt chemistry or in the aggregate. This work we've done recently in which we used AI generative uh, design. Simple, we took AF images and we use what's called the GAN methods in order to generate more structures of this binder representation of this binder that represent the chemistry of it. And now once I generate these images, I can test, I can evaluate them, evaluate the stresses, evaluate their failure in using computational methods. So the images you are looking at here are not real images. They are synthesized images based on training an AI model to create more and more images of the asphalt binder, representation of the asphalt binder by training it using a set of AF images. So you train it first, and then you generate more of it. Once you do this, now you can look at the binder and say, well, this type of material or will generate higher stresses. And if you have a computational damage model, you can say this type of binder has more likely to fail under this type of scenario of loading than the other. Okay, last point I want to make, actually let me go to the, one area is called the digital twin. It's an area where it's being used significantly in the energy field, in the oil industry, in the aviation. What it means that you create a digital twin of your physical model. And your physical model becomes with sensors, the ones that feed data into your computational model. And your computational model becomes the way you predict what's going to happen to this structure over the years. You remember this image I showed of the pavement being a house of sensors, of communication, of smart uh, materials. We can create a digital twin. I think we have a lot of the tools that would allow us to create a digital twin of this pavement structure, the future of pavement structure in which this physical data that we collect from here are used to train the digital model 
once we train the digital model, we can use it to predict what's going to happen to our infrastructure. I think that's a goal that we as a community can adopt and work on, and it's been adopted in other fields. So your physical model is the where you collect the data, you feed it to your digital model, you train it, it becomes your prediction model, whether you want to predict performance of the pavement or you want to predict what's happening to heat transfer, what happens to moisture transfer, all this information becomes data you predict from your uh, digital twin. Okay, so in conclusion, I think there is a lot of advancement that will help us, whether it's through multi-characterization methods like I showed, AFM, AFM, AIR, <coughs> chemical characterization, computational mechanics, AI and smart system and materials that will help us to be more confident about developing sustainable, resilient, and smart pavements. In the education part, I think that's a challenge. There's, that requires a whole discussion on education in general, in engineering, but also in pavement. Because if you want our students to be ready for these challenges, we have to change the way the content and the way we teach or we, they learn the content. We need more flexible engineering curricula that allows students to take knowledge from different fields to be able to use their knowledge to communicate with all the engineers who are going to be involved or are currently being involved in the payment systems. Uh, we need to focus on the acquisition of knowledge because we know that a lot of the content we, we may be teaching might not be useful for these engineers to conquer the, the next decades or, uh, or more in order to look at what's going to happen to our pavement structures. Problems are increasingly complex. I mean, stu students have to be prepared to deal with more complex systems, more complex problems, and that pavements now involve asphalt chemistry, mechanics, um, even equipment, sensors. So we need collaborative education model, educational models where we collaborate with other fields and students work on projects that involve different disciplines. Involve them in open question problems research is a great way and involve them in multidisciplinary topics. With that, I want to acknowledge all those who mentored and collaborated and worked with me and uh, over the years, who I call friends, the former and current graduate students who contributed to this work and to my thinking and my development over the years, and to the agencies who um, were very generous in supporting various of these projects whether they are practical, applied, or blue sky research. Thank you all. Tom, if there are questions. Well, I'll thank you. To... Thank you, Yad, for this, uh, uh, this uh, lecture, which I think brings us uh, 50 years ahead in technology, uh, in guidance of where the pavement engineering area is going to head to. Um, there are some obvious questions. Um, it seems that like the gap between what we know and what we do is widening. In other words, the you know it takes it seems like there's more information to be uh, incorporated into current designs than the the, the approach we use now. Um, yeah. it, it, it used to be that you know you run three tests and uh, you fill the formula. Then we moved on to 50 tests. But still, the methods we use right now are canned, and we're very comfortable with them, and that's what the problem is. It's very hard to change. Yeah, I, I, think, I think some of these methods are good for certain applications. I, I, I'm making the point, and... Uh, that these methods might be useful for designing a pavement for the next 10 years, which is what may be made for, or 20 years. But we cannot use these methods to predict what's going to happen 60 years from now. In fact, even practically, it doesn't make sense because the next generation of engineers, uh, the next generation of engineers will not have these tools. They will advance. So I'm, I'm saying, where do should we advance in order to be able to uh, to be able to adopt and be able to use 
real knowledge in order to predict this effect of climate change. It's just simply the current tools cannot make it for predicting 30, 40 years ahead. Well, perhaps we have the time for some uh, audience questions. Um, the uh, There was a question, let me go to the chat box. Yeah, I uh, Ahmad Mahmoud was asking, what are the key components of a digital twin for the asphalt payment characterization process? And how can these components be integrated into a cohesive system? Very nice, nice question. So when it comes to the digital twin, you want to uh, imitate the physical system. What I'm saying, I mean, I don't, I, I don't believe it's, it's a reasonable effort to, to do a digital twin of what a current passive pavement is. But if we want the pavement to be a house of sensors, self-cleaning, self-healing, that's these are the important aspects of the pavement that we want that will go into the digital twin. So if we are in, in embedding sensors into our pavements, there are ways by which we can create digital twin of these sensors into this uh, digital model of the pavement. And the materials, there will be challenges for how to model the material behavior. But we have advanced as a community towards developing continuum damage models for asphalt pavements or uh, more uh, advanced models that look at the elastic, viscoelastic, viscoplastic behavior of pavement. So to answer his, Ahmed's question, you need to embed in your digital twin a cohesive, the word he used, correct, sensors relationship, material, structural components. And then we can use that digital twin to basically experiment with it, like we did at the material. So at the material side, we were where there are a lot of successes in taking a digital uh, representation of asphalt mixtures. I've shown that, right? But now I'm talking about let's do it for the entire pavement structure. I, I like the approach you introduced, and we had discussed this back at TRB last uh, last uh, January call, was the approach of using uh, probability of extreme events for handling uh, environmental change, climatic changes. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent approach, like we do in all kinds of other areas of civil engineering, and uh, hydrology, in uh, designing hydraulic structures. And, and there is, there is, I, I, I guess the point I'm trying to, I'm differentiating climate change into two parts. The slow change of climate change, which the community recognize, I think that will be addressed simply by uh, the way we do, we already do it. We're already developing better modified asphalt or more resist, moisture resistance. So I'm not worried about the slow effect of climate change. I'm not concerned about it. I don't think it requires a revolutionary change in the way we do business. But when it comes to extreme events, the probabilistic approach you talked about, we know there is more frequent heat waves and there is more frequent flooding. So how do we analyze what type of materials and structures are suitable for those? I think that's where computational analysis and would be used, not only computation, and, and computational analysis and characterization, advanced characterization tools can be adopted to analyze these scenarios for resilient pavements. There is another question on the chat box. Um, uh, Aldidi Yusra asks, how can we elevate the findings from the AFM synthetic pictures um, besides all the findings from the other techniques to provide the protocol for asphalt binder modification? Yeah, I, I uh, that's one of the slides I made, but maybe I went through it quickly. I'm saying that currently our current analysis method cannot make cannot combine data from different sources, meaning when I look at AFM, just AFM alone, you can look, you can get chemical data if you have a, an IR uh, feature, and you can get topography, you can get mechanical, rheological properties, phases. 
I think the AI methods can bridge this information and link it together. Once I understand the structure, the chemical composition, the rheology, at that detailed scale because of the availability of huge data, currently this data is ignored, right? I mean, we cannot just handle it. If I can combine this, I can start to predict why this property the way it is. Because I'm feeding chemical, rheological, nanoscale to maybe predict the macro scale properties. So the answer of Yusra's question, I believe that these AI models can bridge these information characterization methods to predict properties and performance. There is a challenge. The biggest challenge is not on the numerical or in the analytical side. It's on the experimental. These methods are not standardized enough for me to combine my data with your data. So there's a lot of standardization needs to be done on how we collect our data so we can combine it together. Excellent point. Uh, there was another question by Asma Dabiri uh, as to uh, what locations you would pick to put your sensors in a pavement, in a smart pavement structure. I, I, I cannot answer this question to uh, to that level of detail because it depends on the application, what you are trying to measure. Uh, if you're trying to measure stresses and or uh, strains, strains, and the, you have, there are techniques where you embed it uh, at a certain distance from the bottom of the pavement. There are recommendations where you put it so you don't damage these strains. If you want to measure stresses, you put pressure sensors in certain locations. So it depends on the feature or property you're trying to measure. And there is a variety of sensors. I mean, it comes to mind a sensor uh, Michigan State University had developed, whereby you had a three-dimensional uh, stress system in a ball which you could throw into uh, your paving. Correct. Yeah, excellent idea. And again, the concern is that when you pave, you don't want to damage. When you rehab, you don't want to damage your sensors. You want them to stay there. And there are now technologies where people throw capsules into the pavement and these capsules uh, open up and get activated to induce healing based on the stresses applied or based on, on cracks being propagated into the pavement. That's exactly what I'm talking about, smart pavement. So how do we make our pavements more smart through these technologies? I think this digital twin can help us to move towards that goal. So with this, I think we can um, you can join me to thank Dr. Massad for this excellent and and um, prophetic, I would say, presentation uh, on where the technology is going, the payment technology is going. Thank you very much. We applaud you uh, and uh, wish you all the best here. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it, and thanks yeah. for the Geo Institute for making this arrangement and accommodating me on uh, on a digital connection. <laughs> Brad, the well, we, yours. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ayad. This this was really great. Um, it's it's always very cool to see the named lectures, not just because you know they're some of the biggest names in our profession that deliver them, but because of the way they are so all encompassing. It's it's really it's really neat to get a flavor for uh, kind of the oeuvre of the person's work who's who's doing the lecture. So. I really appreciated that. Thank you. And thanks to our viewers for asking questions. You guys are such a huge part of the quality of the presentation. Uh, gives an opportunity for the speaker to get into a little more detail with different stuff. So I just want to make sure I say thank you to everybody who asked a question today and everybody who just watched today. Thanks for being with us. I do want to point out that behind the wall, behind uh, Ayad's uh, desk and his chair there is the Mono Smith Lecture Award, the plaque that you get from the Geo Institute when you are a Mono Smith Lecturer. So we actually gave that to him last year, and it's very cool to see that you've got it up there displayed proudly with uh, all your other stuff. I, I do see a Terzaghi bobblehead back there, too which uh, I appreciate that. So thank you for doing that. So again, for our viewers, uh, if you liked what you saw today and you stuck around till the end, so you probably did, click like, subscribe, get notifications. We will, of course, let you know every time we post something to 
the YouTube channel. We want to make sure we give a plug for the Pavements 2023 conference that's going to be happening in Austin in June. You can visit pavementsconference.org for more information on that and to register, and we hope to see you there. Last thing I have to do today is we're having a changing of the guard in GI. Our producer for our web events for the last year, Amber Davis, this is her final event with us. She's done a great job with us for the past year, and we really appreciate everything she's done for us. And so it's the first event for our brand new producer, Sean Herpelsheimer. So we'll be looking forward to working with him a lot in the future. But thank you so much, Amber, for everything you've done and for making these run so smoothly for the past year. And so with that, I will say we have a live stream coming up on Thursday, Geostrata Extra. You can register and get reminders on Eventbrite. We hope to see you right back here. Otherwise, congratulations again, Ayad. Thank you again, Tom, for running the show today. And we will see everybody soon. Thanks. Thank you so much.